five seconds after that. And so we heard the click of the, of the disposable camera, disposable camera uh, at that point. And, and then we all just kind of collapsed. And so the next pictures, everybody's just, uh, you know. Um, and I think that's what my friend Forrest, and his name was actually Forrest Moss. You can't, you can't make this stuff up. He's a great guy, really outdoorsy kind of guy. And so he, he was kind of leading the, the, the trip that day. And he said, as we started out, he said, okay, look up there. See that, that mountaintop? That's where we're going. Remember that. That's where we're going. And it was good because there were points where I'm like, we're going up there. That's where we're going. I can't remember. That's where we're going. All right, so as we start out today, I want to show you where we're going because there's going to be a little bit of climbing involved between here, between here and there. So where are we going today? What's our, what's our goal? If I could summarize the whole sermon in one sentence, it would be this. When Jesus says, I am the door, it means that he is the gateway to everlasting security and satisfaction in the flock of God. Let me say that again. When Jesus says, I am the door, it means that he is the gateway to everlasting security and satisfaction in the flock of God. Now, let's get hiking. So to give us a little context, I want us to look back. In John chapter 8, where we were last week when Caleb was preaching, in John chapter 8, Jesus is teaching in the courts, in the temple courts on a Sabbath day. The Pharisees get into an argument with him, and it's a long argument. And there are some pretty heated things that get said, some pretty bold things that get said on, on Jesus' part. Jesus says to, to the Pharisees at one point, I am of my father, you are of your father, the devil. Right? There are points where Jesus proclaims his identity as the light of the world. He even says uh, at one point where <laughs> the Pharisees say, we're of our father, Abraham. He says, you know, if you were of Abraham, then you would rejoice in my day just like Abraham saw this coming and rejoiced in it. And they say, like, what, you're not even 50 years old? How can you be, how can you say that you saw Abraham, that you know Abraham? And he says, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus tells us plainly he is Yahweh God. And it registered too, just like Caleb told us last week, because they pick up stones to stone him to death. But, you know, our critics today say, no, well, Jesus never said that he was God. Really? I, I hope that when, by the time we get to the end, the end of this sermon series, we can say, well, they're not just one. Like, there are like at least seven, eight different ones just in this one book where Jesus is telling us that he's God. That's the whole point of this book, right? That we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing we would have life in his name. So they pick up stones to kill him. He slips out because why? It's not his time yet. It's not his time to die. So he steps out of the temple. And as he's stepping out of the temple, he meets this man, this beggar, who's been blind since birth. I think of people like Beethoven who, who were deaf but were still able to compose symphonies. And people would say, well, how is that possible? And it's possible because he wasn't born deaf. This guy was blind since birth. I mean, put yourself in this guy's position. Put yourself in this guy's position. Never seen a beautiful orange sun setting in a beautiful purple and, or and, purple and, and pink sky. Never seen the deep blue of ocean waves. Never seen the crisp green of a dense forest. Never. He doesn't have a category for that. He lives in darkness and he depends upon the kindness of others. And as he's there in the temple that day begging, he hears this man named Jesus and his disciples talking. Now, his disciples, I think they assume that he's deaf and blind because they ask aloud, hey, teacher, um, who sinned, this guy or his parents, that he would be blind? Um, hashtag awkward, right? 
You know that, that moment where like, you know you just said something and you can't take it back? It's like, words, come back, words, you know? But what does Jesus respond? Jesus' response is interesting here. He says, it's not because of his sin. It's not because of his parents' sin. It's that God may be glorified. And there in this man's perfect ears is a voice of hope in an otherwise hopeless world. And imagine, imagine if you, if you can that the next thing that he hears is someone spitting on the ground. And then he feels muddy fingers moving across his, his eyes. And he hears the words, go and wash in the pool of Siloam. So Jesus sends him to a pool named Siloam, which means sent. Interesting, right? So he makes his way through the city, blind, with mud caked all over his eyes. And the words of Jesus ringing in his mind. This is not because of his sin, because of his parents' sin, but that the Lord may be glorified. He finally gets to the, to the pool. He bends down, and as he washes this mud away, suddenly light floods in his open eyes. A world that used to be clouded and shrouded in darkness is now engulfed, overtaken by light, color, texture, depth. He can walk now through the same streets he just stumbled through and, and ask people to lead him by the hand through just a few minutes earlier. Of course, the people around him are stunned. These are people that come to the marketplace. They're going around the temple all the time. They know him and they are dumbfounded at this. This is rocking their world right now. And so they take him to the religious leaders. Surely they can make sense of this. Because it's not every day that a guy that's been blind, maybe as much as 40 years since his birth, can suddenly see so they take him to the religious leaders and in the, the religious leaders in their joy over what's happened, let's share in your happiness here. What do they do? They interrogate him and his parents for most of the day, it seems. They call him a fraud. You can't be that guy. This is just some trick that Jesus set up. You know, like this can't be real. And he says, no, it's real. I'm, I am who I say I am. They get his parents. His parents say, he is who he says he is. And they say, well, how do you explain this? And they're like, I, we don't, we don't want to get kicked out. So you ask him. Great parenting, guys. Great job. But so then they, they question him again. They say, you know, this guy, this guy who's healed you, Jesus, he's a sinner. Come on. You need to agree with us. He's a sinner. Condemn him. And the guy says, I, I don't know if he's a sinner or not, I, but I know this. I was blind, but now I see. <laughs> and he even makes the comp, the comp, like, why are you asking me so many questions? Like, he's out there. Like, do you, do you want to be his disciples too? I, the irony of the moment, right? Like, these people who hate Jesus, and he's saying, do you want to be his disciples? <laughs> That's fantastic. I love it. And so what do they do? They say, this guy is a sinner. You're a sinner. You're guilty by association. And they kick him out. Basically, they revoke his Jew card. He is no longer a part of Judaism. And so in an instant, he is, his identity, his family, his religion, his connection with God, his place in the culture, low as he was, it's gone. And it's been ripped away from him now. He is a complete and total outcast. And as he stumbles away from the temple in, in this storm of confusion, he hears a familiar voice from an unfamiliar face. Do you believe in the Son of Man? The Son of Man. I've heard that before. The Son of Man. Who is the, Oh, that's right. The Son of Man. That's, that's a title from the prophet Daniel about the Messiah, the Christ, the one who's to come. And I think, I think I've heard somebody talking about Jesus, maybe. Maybe he's the Christ. And so he's excited at this point. He says, 
Who is he, sir, that I may believe him? And the man responds, you've seen him. And he's the one that's talking to you. And at that moment, he realizes the one that healed him, who's standing before him right now, isn't just a man. But he is everything that the scriptures say that he is. And what is his response? He says, I believe. And he gives him a pat on the back. No, he worships Jesus. And what does Jesus do? Does he do like every other man, every other angel in the Bible says, no, don't worship me, worship God. No, Jesus is God and he accepts the man's worship. If he's not God, that's scandalous. That's blasphemy. That's wrong. But he's God. And he accepts it. And we need to understand this story to understand our passage today. Because when Jesus is speaking here in chapter 10, this is not separate from chapter 9. John, when he was writing this gospel, he didn't write with, with chapter, verse, division. That, that didn't come until hundreds of years later. It's not inspired like the text is. And so when we read this, we understand he is speaking with this man in earshot. There's some other people that are involved too. We see that at the end of chapter 9, chapter 9, verse 40. <clears throat> chapter 9, verse 40, he says, uh, John writes, or sorry, verse 39, Jesus says, as the man's worshiping him, for judgment I came into this world, that those who, are, who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. And some Pharisees, religious leaders, probably some of, the, some of the very same ones that just kicked him out, are standing there. They, hear, they heard these things and they said to him, um, <clears throat> are we all so blind? Are you, what are you saying here? You know, They're looking for a reason to get angry at Jesus. And they've been doing that for quite some time now in the story. Jesus said to them, if you were blind, then you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. The blind man humbly admitted his blindness, humbly admitted his need and believed in the words of Jesus. Jesus made him see physically and spiritually here, right? But the Pharisees, claiming to see, rejected Jesus. Even though they had experienced his words, we talked about in this gospel, his words, his walk, and his works. They saw, they saw all these things. And yet still, claiming to see, they blind themselves to the truth. And in their hardness of heart, they're blinded all the more. John 10, verse 1. Remember, there's no division here, so the conversation just rolls on. Jesus continues his response to the Pharisees uh, with what he calls in verse 6, a figure of speech. Now, at that just means that he's, he's going to tell them a story. He's going to use a word picture to explain what's going on, to explain in a little bit more detail. It's not specific. Um, and it has a lot of common things of the day. Things like a sheepfold. We'll talk about that. Sheep, a door, shepherd, a gatekeeper, and a stranger. Jesus doesn't really apply himself to any of these things. He doesn't draw a connection to any of these things yet. It's kind of like he's, you know, sometimes you, you have a conversation and you're, you're saying, well, I really don't want to use all this detail yet. So you kind of, you, you paint a broad, you paint with broad strokes and you just, you, you wait and see like, okay, are they, are they going to respond to this? Are they going to understand? And then you go into more detail if necessary. That's, that's kind of what's happening here. Jesus knows all. He knows what's going to happen. Uh, but yet he's giving an opportunity here. And so, he uses this, uh, and then when the Pharisees don't understand, Jesus circles back around in verse 7, and he starts applying, the past, he starts applying this word picture to himself. First, he says, I am the door. And then secondly, starting in verse 11, on through verse 18, which we won't cover this week, we'll cover that next week, he says, I am the good shepherd. 
So basically, the idea here of what's going on is Jesus is telling both the Pharisees and this man, this uh, man formerly known as blind, ha. <clears throat> um, he's telling them that, that he as the good shepherd is gathering a flock. He's gathering a flock for himself, the people of God. And, he's, and in this case, he is gathering them out of a fold. Now, what is a fold? A sheep fold is kind of like a sheep pen, a, uh, an open area surrounded, and, and that time usually surrounded by stone walls where sheep were, were placed or put for, for safekeeping so they could rest there securely. Usually a village would have its own village sheepfold. And so there would, be, there would maybe be a couple of different shepherds, a couple of different flocks, all there inside the one sheepfold. And <clears throat> the shepherd, would, um, the shepherd would, would come in the morning, would call to his sheep. The sheep would recognize the shepherd's voice and only come if they heard the shepherd's voice calling them. The sheepfolds wouldn't, I mean, the, the, the flocks themselves, the group of sheep would not be that big. And so the shepherd would know his sheep. I mean, know them. He would know if they had any kind of wounds. He would probably have a name for them. That's not really a, a stretch for us. We name our pets. We might have a goldfish even, you know, with a name. Um, but, he, but the shepherd would know the sheep, would call them, take them out for the day. They go out for the day into the pasture, they, they graze, they eat. And then at nighttime, he brings them back in. And as he would bring them back in, they would, they would all have to go through the door. There would be one door for this fold. And so the shepherd would hold his staff out, to kind of almost like a, what's the, like a turnstile, kind of stopping, stopping each sheep and inspecting the sheep as they come back in, making sure there's, there's nothing wrong, there's no... There's no signs of sickness. There's no injuries. It kind of gives a whole new meaning to when Jesus says, like, even the hairs on your head are numbered. Jesus knows you. He knows you better than you know you because you belong to him. And so he would inspect each one and then he would allow it to pass in. Um. <clears throat> Now, when we, when we read this passage, um, we, and you know, I'm, I know you've heard this from us a lot, context is key here. Because if we just read this passage without considering other stuff around it, we can make all kinds of mistakes and all kinds of misinterpretations about what these things mean. Um, also, we need to be careful about trying to make sure that everything means something. Um, if Jesus doesn't allude to something, let's, let's, let's kind of, let's, we don't have to go there. We don't have to map out everything. So, but here, I think we can say that the fold is not heaven because it talks about people going, about people going in and out. And I mean, once you go to heaven, you're there. You're like, you're, you're with Jesus, right? It's not talking about the church. Here, in this context, Jesus is talking about the fold being ethnic Israel. Because later on, well, first of all, he says in Matthew 15, 24, Jesus states that his mission is, he says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. In this stage in his ministry, this is the goal. But he also says in this chapter, chapter 10, verse 16, he says, I have sheep that are not of this fold and I must bring them. Friends, that's you and me. If you're not a Jew, that's for you. Isn't that good? That Jesus that, at that point says, I'm coming for you. And how does he do that? That's what Luke is saying in, in, in Acts chapter one, that this was the beginning of what, Jesus bega of what Jesus was doing and teaching. He does it through his body, through the church. And friends, if you're in Christ, it's because the body of Christ came to you doesn't mean that a whole church showed up at your door. It's because a believer interacted with you in your life. And that was by the sovereign plan of God to draw you to himself. Isn't that good? It's because he loves you. He has a name for you. He, he's known you since before you were born. And he wants you for himself. He loves you.
So we're thinking about this fold. The fold has, again, one door. And only one person, only, only the person that enters by the door is a shepherd. I mean, think about it. If, you, if you're the shepherd, if you own these sheep, why would you want to try to climb over the wall to get in when you've got a door? And you've got somebody there that you're paying a gatekeeper to help protect your flock. That's ridiculous, right? Nobody needs to go in through any other way but the door. Unless you're not the shepherd. Unless you want something that's not yours. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Truly, truly, I say to you, verse 7, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. Jesus came in the right way. Jesus came exactly as all of the Old Testament said that he would. Therefore, the thieves and the robbers who don't come in by the door are false Christs, false messiahs, self-appointed leaders. They claim to offer what only Jesus could. They tried to lead God's, they tried to lead God's people without God. And in particular here, Jesus is talking about the Pharisees. Jesus, this is what Jesus says about the Pharisees in Matthew 23, verse 4. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move a finger. Remember, these Pharisees, they were consumed with this idea of keeping the law, doing what's right, obey the law in order to gain favor from God. And so when they hear about this man this beggar who has been healed and made whole, he can see now, apart from the works of the law, they're dumbfounded. This, they don't have a category for this. How, how, how did you do this? What did he do to you? How could this happen? Because they're looking for something that's going to have to come in accordance with works of the law. You work hard enough, God will bless you. Man, does that sound familiar? It sounds like popular culture in our world today, right? It sounds like every religion. Work hard and maybe God will bless you. Maybe you can get to nirvana. Maybe you can have paradise. Maybe you can become your own God of your own planet. And people believe that. And sometimes they're willing to do more than we who have the truth are. May that not be the case. These, these leaders, they're more concerned about their own control, their will, their system. They're more concerned about those things than experiencing the sovereign grace of God working in their midst. They should be on their faces. And they're saying, this man's a sinner. And as a result, these false shepherds are mistreating and casting out one of their own sheep. But what God meant for evil, or sorry, what man meant for evil, God meant for good. They, and I want you to hear the word play here because it's very deliberate in the, in the Bible here. I love the way that John does this. They cast him out. But then Jesus says, but I brought him out. And he brought him out through a door. And so what does it mean? He says, when he's brought out, those that are his, what, what does that mean? What does it mean to be brought out through the door? Jesus says in chapter 10, verse 9, I am the door. He says it twice in this passage. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go, out, go in and out and find pasture. So what does it mean to enter by the door? What does it mean to enter by Jesus? It means believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's what it means. That's the point of this whole book, right? Don't you love it when you hear a story that's right in line with everything that, that the writer is intending? It's beautiful. It just unfolds right here. I mean, this was like easiest sermon prep time ever. Like, pff, there it is. Hey! Let's see, the application is the hard part. We'll get there. Um, 
So it means that believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and it's not just intellectually agreeing that Jesus is who the Bible says he is, right? It's not just, oh, I agree with that. It is completely trusting with all of your heart to all that Jesus is and all that he's done. And if you're leaning, trusting completely in him, you cannot lean upon your own understanding, just like Proverbs 3, 5 says. You can't lean on those sinful things, the things that the world is offering you that, that promise security and, and satisfaction. You, you can't lean on those. You can't serve two masters, Jesus says. So entering by the gate means that we, entering by the door, by Jesus, means that we trust in him and we turn from our sin. And friends, I want you to see this. This is the, I, just, I love that the more that I've seen this about Jesus, the, all the sweeter. I just, it's, how do I say this? Being married has been such a, an eye-opener to me and just realizing that I am so short-sighted. I am so not looking for what God has planned. Because you, I, there are moments where I think, my wife is the most beautiful woman in the world. It's not possible for someone to be more beautiful and more wonderful to me. And then I wake up the next day and I realize somehow she has become even more beautiful than she already was. And I want you to see this about Jesus, that the more we know about Jesus, the more we get to know him, the more beautiful we realize that he is. And I love that for all of eternity, that's what it's going to be. That the, we'll just encounter him more and more and our understanding of him will grow and grow and we'll never be exhausted. And we'll see every day how much more beautiful he is to us than the day before. And so look here in verse 9. There's an emphatic statement here. And I know, I, I, we, I told you the first week that every one of these statements has an emphasis right? Because Jesus is saying, ego I me, I, I am, or I myself am. So that's there. That emphatic statement's there, but there's another one right behind it. Where do you think it is? Jesus says, if anyone, if anyone enters by me. Do you hear the grace dripping off that statement? I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. He will go in and out and find pasture. See this. He, Jesus is, is working both ends of the spectrum here. Jesus has already extended this invitation to the outcast, the beggar. And he said, yes. He said, oh, yes. And he ran for it, right? But I want you to see this too. He's making this, he's talking at this moment, not necessarily to the beggar because the beggar's, the beggar's in. He's got it made now. He's talking to the Pharisees. Hardened in heart. Don't think they'll ever get saved. And Jesus extends grace to them. Yes, he's being harsh with them. He's being very bold with them, but he is extending grace. And I wonder how many of us, was that our story? People would think that person, no, they would never, they would never trust in Jesus. And yet Jesus extended grace to us. And here we are. Who around you seems like the most unlikely convert possible. If anyone. If that anyone is you. If, you, if you're not trusting in Jesus right now, then you, you can know that if anyone is for you. You don't have to adduce, make some big gesture to, a, to impress him. You don't have to make some big contribution to a charity. You don't have to get your life all fixed up. You don't have to put on a good face and show up to worship every Sunday. Not to earn his favor. Because this, if anyone, is for you. He's not waiting for you to come to him. He has come to you. And he's here.
And he's more than able to transform your life and make you new in him, but only in him. And so that's, that's the other side of this, is that there is the if anyone, but it's only through Jesus. And people, people hear that and they say, well, that's closed-minded, too narrow. Friends, I think we're seeing all the more in our day. There's truth, and there's alternative truth. No, there is. There's truth, and there's falsehood. And it's funny, as an American, it's funny to me that both sides of the aisle are seeing this. You got people on both sides that are willing to say, no, alternative facts are not facts. Well, wow. Really? That's awesome. We agree on that. Okay, good. Let's talk about Jesus. You know, like, here we go. I mean, wide open door here, folks. We just have to be willing to step through it and to show people love in Christ and extend grace to them. We don't want to be more stingy than Jesus is. So believers, as you make your way throughout the city and throughout your daily schedule, are you extending this invitation of God to people into your life, much less into the flock of God? So, We've said, what is, the goal, what, is the, what is the door? Jesus is the door. What does it mean to go through the door? It means to trust in Jesus. And then what does Jesus promise to those who are in his flock? Two things, security and satisfaction. Security and satisfaction. Let's look at security. Verse nine, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. It means to persevere, to, to survive a calamity. But notice that it is passive. It's receiving, bata, right? It's receiving something. It's not, he who enters by me saves himself. No, is saved. Jesus offers security to those who enter through him. And hear me when I say this, it's not a worldly security. It's not a financial security or a job security or an emotional security, a medical or health security. It's better than that. It's an, it's an eternal, everlasting soul security. This is what Jesus says later on in this passage. Verse 27, he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. And they never, they will never perish, and not one of them will snatch, or and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Listen. Then he doubles it up, and he says, "My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one will be is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand." And then he brings them together. He says, "I and the Father are one." So if you're in Christ, you're in Christ. You're in God. You're in Christ and God because Christ is God, and no one can snatch you out of His hand. So your bank, your bank account might be cleared out by a hacker. You might lose your job. You might face loneliness, depression, loss, sickness, even death. But I can tell you that if you're in Christ, not one of those things or anything else in all creation can separate you from the love of God in Christ. It can't. Because he's better and stronger and greater than all. He's got you, right? Jesus got this, right? So what does that mean? That means that you can love Jesus and serve him without fear. You can spend every day for, ev for the rest of your life making disciples, doing what he's commanded us to do and knowing him, knowing that the worst thing that, ha that could happen is they kill you. But that's also the best thing that could happen because it's, you know, killed, boom, heaven, awesome. Because that's where Jesus is, Right? You have a shepherd who loves you. And if you've entered into his flock through him, you have nothing to worry about for the rest of your days except loving him more. So security and satisfaction. Oh, this is where it gets sweet. I am the door, verse nine. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. 
Jesus promises an everlasting satisfaction to those who enter through him. Hear me, and it's not a satisfaction, or sorry, it is a satisfaction that you can enjoy right now. In Christ, it's yours. But it's not a satisfaction in things. It's not a satisfaction in a situation. It's not a satisfaction even in people. Please hear me. Don't look for the satisfaction in people because they will always let you down. Your elders will always let you down. Isn't that encouraging? <laughs> Jesus will never let us down. People weren't created to hold your hope. And I feel like we need to hear that. We're going to fail you. We don't, we're, we're learning as your elders. We're, we're getting better at this, we hope. But even when our new pastor comes, he can't hold your hope. And if you're putting your hope in him, you're missing it. Put your hope in Jesus and he will never fail you. Listen to what the Bible says about this. Because Jesus, again, the whole thing about this gospel is that we would have life in his name. And again, what is life? What is this everlasting eternal life? John 17, 3. This is eternal life that they would know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. But that life that we're talking about is wrapped around God. And it's the best thing we could ever hope for. Psalm 16, verse 11. I think I've said it in every sermon I've ever preached here at Redeemer. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand is pleasure forever. Pleasure forever. And even the nature of evil confirms this is true. Jeremiah 2, verse 13, God says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that hold no water. We've exchanged the fountain that's flowing with living water and we try to suck moisture out of the dirt. Like C.S. Lewis said, it's like a kid playing in a mud puddle when he's been promised a day at the beach. We are far too easily satisfied. And God didn't do you a favor that you, he expects you to repay over, over your lifetime. He's given you a gift that you can never repay. And he knows that. The most encouraging thing, I think I've told this to everybody today. The most encouraging thing I've heard this week is that he remembers our frame and he knows that we're dust. He knows you can't repay him. That's not the point. The point is that in Christ, we've been restored to the very thing we were created for, knowing and enjoying God forever. That's it. Enjoying God. Him. And that reshapes everything. Reshapes the way you eat, you eat food. Yes, you can enjoy food, but food is meant to point you to him because he created food and he made it good. Praise God, he made it good, right? Praise God, red velvet cake is good. You know? That's good stuff. Sorry. My bad. Got a little excited about red velvet cake, I guess. Um, it the way we enjoy our friendships. When, when we're deeply cared for, when we're known so deeply and yet loved so deeply, it points us back not to that person because that person is gonna fail, but to Jesus who knows us better than anyone and loves us completely. Isn't that good? We have to retrain ourselves to, pro to process our lives in this way. That it's about Jesus and that Jesus reshapes everything. And so as we apply, just a couple of questions. I'm going to rattle through them really quick. First, are you actively turning from your sin and trusting in Christ? All this other stuff, the promises and everything, that's, that doesn't apply to you if you're not in Christ. And it's not, did you make a decision back some time in the past? Did you sign a card? Did you pray a prayer? Did you do something? No. Are you trusting Jesus? 
Because if you're not trusting Jesus now, if that's not the pattern of your life, we have serious questions to ask about that event back in the past. And, and I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to tear you down. I want, your, I want your salvation, your understanding of your salvation to be built upon who Jesus is and your relationship with him, not based upon something you did, because that doesn't sound like grace at all, does it? Well, I did this. Really? I'm pretty sure like 66 books have something to say about that. So are you trusting in Jesus? Secondly, how well do you know his voice? Jesus says, uh, there are others that come in, that climb over the wall, and, and, but the sheep don't go to them. Why? Because they don't know their voice. How well do we know our Savior's voice? When you hear somebody twisting scripture in conversation, and it happens, folks, all the time, we're way more religious of a society than we give ourselves credit for. We quote Bible all the time. We just quote it out of context and we twist words here and there. How well do we know our Savior's voice so that when we hear a fraud, we know it? How regularly are you reading God's word? We're reading through John right now. Join us. It's a great first step. We're about halfway. We're in John chapter 10, starting in verse 22 tomorrow morning. Join us. Are you hiding God's word in your heart? Are you memorizing God's word? Let me encourage you. Have a plan for that. So that when you have different, in, different issues, different situations in your life, that you can say, okay, what, what does God's word say about this? If you, want, if you want help working on that, talk to us. We'd love to help you with that. We're working on that too. It's something we're doing for the rest of our lives. Also, we memorize scripture every month here at church, at church. John 20, 31, right now. We'll start with a new one next week. Join us. Start that pattern of hiding God's word in your heart. And then lastly, what would it look like for you to pursue Jesus? Pursue him. Not wave at him. Hey, Jesus, how you doing? We're talking full tilt, running after Jesus, trusting him. What would that look like? Trusting him as your security and your satisfaction. What would that look like in your spiritual life? We're different people. We're in different places here. So I'm challenging you. What does that look like in your life? What does that look like in your spiritual life, your, your worship, your personal private worship with him? What does that look like? What does that look like in your family life? Again, friends, like there's no person that can hold your hope. Jesus can do that only. So what does it look like to pursue Jesus as your security and your satisfaction in your family life, in your, in your dating relationships, in your, in your marriage? Only in Christ are you secure and are you completely satisfied and cared for so that then you can love that other person. Because again, love is not something that, that hits us and then leaves like the measles, right? Oh, I've fallen in love, I've fallen out of love. Like that doesn't, that's not what the Bible says that love is. Love is a choice we make for the good of that other person. And we can't truly love people if we're hoping that they're gonna love us back. We can't truly do that. So instead, we need to turn our affection first and foremost to Jesus and rely upon him so that then we can love other people. And if they don't love us back, okay, I got Jesus. What does it look like in your business, your work life, your financial life? What does it mean that Jesus is your security in this day and age? What does it look like that Jesus is your satisfaction? More so than that pay raise, more so than that promotion. And of course, all these things overlap. But I really, I just want to set these things in front of us today so we can just start looking in that direction. So remember, when Jesus says, I am the door, he is saying that he himself is the gateway, the gateway 
to everlasting security and satisfaction in his flock. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for everything that you've done for us. We don't deserve any of it. And in your grace, you've poured it all out on us. Thank you. Lord, would you produce transformation in us? Lord, I pray that in a room like this, surely there are people that don't know you. I pray that you would produce repentance and faith. You would produce salvation in this room today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.